these are my learnings that what was uh, needed when you go to a new company and you start a brand new team what are the strategies you should follow um i would also um go through some case study that in last 9 months what i have done uh, in uh, gudarex um, and then the later part will be about a later trend called visual regression that we are using at scale um to scale our qa department so a little bit intro about myself that's my husband in the background and my 3 years old daughter um i was born in calcutta and from 2010 i am in us and uh, i love traveling i traveled five continent already and uh, looking for the other two um i love to work out i'm a work workout holic so if you are in my team you have to learn to uh, listen to my workout stories every day almost um and i love to meet new people so please uh, uh, talk to me at the end of the session give me feedback how i did uh this was my strategy for my team and uh, so i have a dedicated sa team like it's a service team which helps all our relief qas and i have a offshore team in back in uh, india uh, who does the testing um when we are sleeping here so i almost have a 24 bar 7 cycle so uh, the relief qas help with new features the sa's writes our core tools and help the relief qas and uh, our offshore testers uh help the relief qa it's like having more hands to the people um who can work faster and deliver faster so why did i choose uh, this uh, topic taming your dragon so you everybody must have known that um, a dragon is a four leg serpent which vents uh, fire right uh, in in my career i thought like lot of company think qa is like a dragon who only reports defect who who are bottlenecks who slows down um releases a um, lot of them things we don't need it and there are cases where uh, they can be without uh, without qa they can be successful and qa can just come as a strategist or coach uh, and stuff and that i'm going to go through um but i think uh, going back to the same cartoon movie that uh, that was there on my first slide that if you utilize us towards your goal we can help you achieve better quality and we can help you achieve release faster um that's what the movie showed right and i'm a die hard cartoon fan i learned from everything and i have a 3 years old so i'm i'm like forced to watch all the movies um so it's like a um dragon whose name was toothless and uh, this guy called hiccup who was like really different from all the other people so when his community thought they have to fight dragons this little guy went and befriended a dragon and utilized him uh, for his own community right the so same thing like if you want to want to integrate with qa think of them as a friend a uh, friend guide philosopher and um, uh, they going to work with you along with you to help you achieve your goal faster and better i'm sorry the quality of this um, picture is not enough but i just want to touch base like what exactly qa means what a test engineer actually does uh, in their day to day life it's not just looking at requirements and matching requirements that it is um um working or not we wear lot of hats sometimes we are designing sometimes we are strategists sometimes we are communicator sometimes we are um i i would say you have to be very political to talk to some uh, people in the team so that you are not offending them right sometimes uh, you have to just observe from the far if they are getting offended um so everything like in our day to day job it's very very important uh, that we wear this um, different hats and i got this from um linkedin and i was very fascinated that how much like one person does in every team and it's so true um so next i want to talk about some key factors so if you are joining a team tomorrow where there is no qa and you want to integrate a brand new qa team what you should uh, think about so the next few few slides going to be um talking about that um so the first factors i found is size so work like you could end up working for different kinds of company a pre startup maybe uh, which is not yet live and um, there the risk is really low right you don't have to support lot of people the budget might be an issue so you might be restricted to use tools those which are free um you might have to even support like 10 developers with yourself and you have to come up with a strategy like how with minimal budget you will be able to integrate like one example i will give like when i was working for a startup called homey 
there were no budget so my whole team was crowdsourced i utilized a company called applause and like i used to send all the releases like to them and they used to be my qa and i came up with that strategy that single handedly i won't be able to support their app web api so how can i um utilize other things the crowdsource people who can come and help us doing that the next one is startup so they some startup they might have not be um uh, they might not have started doing qa so there your job is to do and introduce a process uh, they might not have budgetary issues but risk can be very high in some cases because when they're integrating qa they are expecting you that you will be giving them really uh, good quality and then there is some big enterprise like visa um, walmart where they have like really big team like i was taking interview a person from pandora and he said his team is 37 people big and he has a dedicated person who goes and make sure all the mobile devices are on so not everybody is as lucky to have that team so when you integrate a big team on a mature enterprise your strategies will be completely different so next thing next big factor was the uh, bug tolerance uh, limit like the risk um so some we we all know that facebook did not have a qa for a long time right so uh, the risk is really low and it depends on the product to product uh, again if it is a pre released app the risk will be really low um as because it's low volume but then there can be some companies like hill where it's a doctor house call company and a doctor comes to your house and uh, checks you right so there if if your uh, medical history is not working if your ehr is not working if your iot is not working then there is no questions um, like it, it cannot work in production like you have to be very sure that your strategies are working for this company then come to the present company gudarex they serve almost 10 million customers uh, every month so even one bug means thousands of dollars so your strategy will vary like how you will be making sure that uh, um the uh, the quality is assured for that kind of company the next few factors are test environment so when you end up being the first test manager sometimes you will be surprised to see that there is no qa environment there is only dev environment and they just directly push it to production so it's your duty to coach them that you need a deterministic environment to test um what you are testing it's very very important to have a test environment uh then another big part is team culture um qa is responsibility of everyone uh, i'll give example of gudarex and everybody in my team test the product the developers us the qa uh, my estate so it's not like we are catch all and they throw over the fence and we going to be finding everything that does not help and the last one is tools so uh, when you join as a qa manager or a qa lead in a company it's very very important that you choose the right tools looking at what kind of strength you have so if you just happen to have qa tester they won't be able to write selenium web driver so they, you might choose plug and play um uh, play uh, rec play and record tools right um also you have to see that that record and play tools going to work for your company or not is it complex enough um that those kind of tool will not be working so this kind of strategies really help um to succeed this is just a simple code which says path to success and path to failure is exactly same and it's up to you how uh, you choose the path and i i really believe in this so this talk is about when i joined the last three companies what strategies i took so i came up with a formula that is three steps one is first few days just learn from your failure like why the company did not have qa why they failed before um then plan like what you going to be poing proof of concept then implementation and then scale so when i started learning from failures these these are the some of the points that came up and um the number one was imbalance usually when when a company starts integrating with qa there is like really low number of qa like one or two and they think they are unicorn and they gonna support everybody and find everything so as a qa manager i think we have to set the expectation right and say that that does not work and we have to scale or come up with a strategy that the balance is there between um qa and uh, developer so then there is no process i think one of the key things as a qa manager you can do is you can introduce processes like what helps so how the jira workflow going to work for your team how uh, how you will be doing automation will there be ci pipelines will there be 
uh, manual QA needed on production to do sanity? Do you run regression every night? Those kind of strategies. Um, then fragile regression suit, which takes hours and days. So as a manager, I think it's very important um, you educate your team with the newest technology and uh, make sure they know the industry norm, how, how much uh, time it should take to run your regression cycle. And I have few slides to go over um, that and uh, I'm going to show you what the industry standards are. The major problem I found uh, in most of the companies is that there is no test hook. So if you just join a company and you just start writing automation tests, it will be very, very fragile because if you don't have dedicated test hooks or IDs, um, it will fa fail left, right, center. And I'll give an example of um, companies like uh, GoodRx. We run a lot of A-B testing to make sure that our features are, um, our, our features are uh, getting, uh, like our users are getting accustomed to our features, right? And if we don't have test hooks, our test will not run. It will fail every time we push to production. And we almost uh, push like 15 to uh, 12 to 15 times a day. So then there can be infrastructure is issues again. So when you land up as a first QA manager, you might see that there might be breakage end to end. Like there won't be any environment where you can test end to end. There won't be any environment like pre-production pre where you have to make sure it's exactly like production. And you have to verify your test again that sometimes test environments are like completely different than what is production. Like they, they are not at thought about, the databases are not as big, um, all those things. And then the automation, maybe um, educating yourself with the latest technology and trend gives you an edge to scale your team really fast in a very small amount of time. And I'm going to cover some visual regression tests in later part of my um, slides. So what are some of the POC's uh, point that made um, uh, me and my team very successful was tool selections. Again, like I, when I joined GoodRx, there was only one QA um, automation engineer. And then like uh, after we jotted down what we needed for our uh, team, like what is the return on investment we are looking at? What is the a tool uh, we'll be doing? Should we go for record and playback? Should we do Selenium web driver? Um, uh, then like setting up a realistic expectation. One thing I see a lot in our industry when people try to do POCs, they just write two tests. They just pick up one um, tool and they write two tests and they think, oh, this is awesome tool. I'm going to use this one. And and then later on, when they start to scale with it, they just, read a, uh, they just hit a roadblock because that tool might not be helpful. That tool might not be scalable with thousands of tests. So have a realistic at least minimum 40 to 50 test cases when you do POC, do for a month at least to see how they are performing. Um, are there any roadblocks? Is the tech support uh, good? Is there is a community around it? Does that company innovate enough for you to stick to that tool? Uh, I'll give an example of um, Selenium web driver. It, it's everybody almost uses that as an automation tool, right? Um, same with Apply, like that they are number one company for visual regression and they, have, they are innovating in a very high speed. speed. Like if you look at their um, data and product, like they are inventing every day. There is a very large, they have like developer advocates, which goes and talks about their stuff, what cool they are doing. So those are a very cool thing. I'll tell a funny story. Like how many of you know about a tool called Monkey Talk? Anyone? Monkey Talk? No one knows in this room. So in 2012, when I was working for a company called TrueCar, I took that tool that was, I don't know from where I found and I thought I'm going to automate all mobile automation with this tool. This is really cool. And they had a training program. I went and did the training program, came back, wrote three, four tests. And after that, I, I hit a really bad roadblock because they had no community support. Not many people were using it. They, I could not Google the, and like the blockers I had. So that was really a bad decision to choose from. So you might be getting a lot of uh, emails from a lot of vendors saying that, oh, we are the record and playback. Just come. We have AI also. Use us. But be very, very cautious when you're introducing a tool to your team as a manager or as a lead. Um, uh, look at it that it, does it really provide any value. Maybe it's very simple to record playback and just play it. But will it be helpful in long run? Will there be a ROI on that or not? Um, so then came the scaling part of it. Everybody, I'm sure here knows the test pyramid. So usually um, all, in all my companies, the backend developers are awesome and they have a huge selections of 
um, unit test. Um, when I joined as a first uh, QA manager, I, we had like really long manual test cycles. We, we did not have any API test. Then we started building on the, on that automation test where we made sure that we are we are automating our core path, happy path first, um, then edge cases, and then a whole regression suite. Um, and um, then we like connected to the pipelines and on, on the top you are seeing visual regression. That's something like was given to me in my present company by the higher ups and it's, it's a game changer in the sense that just think about a tool where you have to check manually like 300 pages every time it goes live. Impossible for a human, right, to catch stuff. Um, so we do a visual regression on the top like we started doing that in the first few months this was our pyramid but then it, today it's changed now we have a really large set of uh, visual regression tests and then uh, on the top we do um, manual testing just to, just to, uh, tell you something i have some easter egg all over my um, slides if you happen to find any mismatch on the UIs and uh, any mismatch, like any, any spelling mistakes or anything like that, you you are entitled to a really cool water bottle. So just let tell me and uh, and and uh, grab one from there. So I want to pause for a second and tell you. So I have a three years old and she goes through all these cartoon stories and it's a very famous story called Three Little Pigs. So it's about three li three li piggy uh, brothers and uh, their mom asks them to build a house. So they go and. Uh, the first one chooses straw and build the house within hours. The second one goes, uh, chose wood, build the house maybe in a day or two. But the third one took days to build a house with solid brick and stuff. So there was a wolf who came and tried to eat all of them. When he came to the first one, he could enter the house immediately. The second one, he could blow it down. But the third one, he could not destroy that house. So what we learn from this story is any good thing takes time and you need to write, you need to use right uh, tools to build it, to uh, make it go for long run. Coming to the case study, so this is our website, GoodRx, where you go search for a um, prescription drug and it shows the pricing of it. It looks very simple, but it's a very regulated uh, industry and you have to be very sure that when you are showing pricing, when you are showing some information, warning, FDA updates, they are uh, like top notch and they are, there is no mistake because um, it can be very harmful if, if something is wrong, right? Like the strategy that I showed you previously, so we started with learning what our QA goals were. So we, uh, we needed distributed QA to help like lot of developers immediately. So I had a, um, in first month we had like QA teams. Uh, offshore and then like ramping up onshore really quickly then dedicated estate team who will who will not be asked to do any manual QA. One problem I see is uh, people today say oh if we have QA engineers they automate, they test, they do release but the reality is if you are supporting release you hardly get time uh, to do automation. So then that becomes a back burner and you, you don't get to succeed on that. Then choosing a robust uh, framework, uh, doing test uh, test stabilization pipeline. So one thing that makes my team very successful is we have a test uh, stabilization pipeline using Travis. So every time anybody pushes code to master, it, it works and it runs against all the other tests using Travis. And then uh, it gives us a report that none of the other tests are affected using all cross browsers. So we support eight different cross browsers in uh, eight different um, devices. And it goes through like almost 500 tests to, to tell us that if the new test is affecting the other old tests or not. That's a great strategy we are using here. Um, and then the regression, uh, then the goal, the last goal was to automate almost all the, uh, all the regression uh, suits to reduce 90% of the time. So after we decided about our goal, the main, the other goal was to hire people and to hire people we needed strategy that what we will be, what we are, who will be, who we will be hiring and what are the skills we are uh, looking for. So to streamline what uh, we will be hiring, these are like some of the really, really good point I found on LinkedIn that um, when you are hiring for a QA analyst, they, their critical thinking has to be top notch. So when they are given a, a, a project and feature, 
they should not be like uh, as a manager you should not be hand holding them and they should be independent enough to create their test cases and um create uh, talk to the product talk to the developer and work with them so these are some of the um, the points that i really believe in when i hire somebody in my team um like enthusiasm team playing assertive and creative thinkers like these these are really cool uh, points that you should uh, take a note about as well sure that's a very large topic but one thing i would say like suppose you are very frustrated while writing code and you see like somebody has written a very bad xpath and you just go to the channel and say this xpath is bullshit it can emo emotionally harm the person who has written that right so you have to be intelligent enough to control your emotion and talk to other people such a way that they going to take your feedback constructively and work on that and not get like uh, emotional or not get defensive when you are um, putting across your thought but it's a very big topic and there are a lot of readings online um if you want to read about it then we selected our tech stack so our back end is python and uh, selenium web driver we use bdd uh, behavioral driven testing so our qa analyst can write the tests um and our sdks can do the automation uh, we use browser stack for our cloud runner we use 100 nodes and our tests today our whole regression to a test takes less than 2 minutes um then applitude for visual regression we have jenkins and travis again um like our pipelines run on jenkins but our stabilization pipeline that that i just explained 2 minutes back that our own tests run using travis to make sure it's not breaking our other tests that's our stabilization pipeline and for that we use travis we use jira for bug bug tracking and ticket tracking and we use we use test rail for um, test case management so after we decided who we are hiring and what our tech stack was this is the timeline uh, played out it's like in june 2018 there was one qa then we were able to scale 300% and we had a senior estate qa analyst offshore team um by end of december 2018 we had all p0 p1 um automated we had kinaker pipeline um started working there like if back end were pushing 5 to 6 times a day they they were running our automated test cross browser support um something cool we do is our mobile web test runs on real mobile device like i have seen people just resizing the web and make, making it like a mobile web and running but uh, one thing we take pride on we write it on uh, we run it on real mobile devices then again in 2019 we scaled another 300% and and uh, we were able to cover our full regression suite we were um, able to cover edge cases and now today we run tests which are automation first so when developer develops our automate automation engineers uh, create the test how we do that um, so creating this test hook is a process embedded in our development process so when the designer shows us designed we go to their zipline file and we tell them okay this 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 element requires this 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 ids so when developers are developing they are already creating data qa ids for us so we don't have to go back and ask for them or beg for them like it's in embedded in our sdlc cycle to make us happy this for the ci cd uh, success criteria we came up with that we will be taking data from our uh, google analytics and we will make sure that all top 6 browsers are covered in in our uh, ci cd pipeline we'll do visual validation we also will do like speed because we release almost 12 to 15 times a day uh, we could not have a pipeline which will take hours or days it takes only 2 minutes because we use 100 uh, parallel nodes and we have created the framework such a way that the tests are not dependent on each other so we can just launch 100 tests together this is how today uh, the pipeline runs uh, into the rx so we have hourly run of p0 p1 then we have pipelines which helps all the uh, pushes to production and then we have nightly regressions for um, 300 test cases 6k data run every night on all different browsers so i just want to stop for a second and talk about this shift left and uh, risk mitigation strategy like every meetup i go to everybody is talking about shifting left um testing 
um, developers testing like but what is this about and how even as a QA we can embrace this so three cool things I learned in my present company is um, you can do shiftless strategies even with a QA team as well so there are products which we shift without QAing its lower environment but then we use feature flag so when you use a feature flag it's only um, available using that feature flag it's a parameter that you put on the URL and it will be only available to you first because not, no other person can know what the feature flag is so you can push stuff iteratively on production test with production database mimic a actual customer and uh, and test it there so you are not like hindering your team um, speed right so you can uh, talk to your dev uh, development uh, team or your managers that um, with even having QA, they can help testing in production and using feature flag. Then traffic allocation, um, we use something called split. When we introduce a new feature in production, we go with 5% traffic to make sure that our features are stable. Um, it is not creating any um, any um, edge cases where like our traffic is drop, like our conversion is dropping or something. So like gradually increasing the traffic to the newer. Um, product helps us a lot to make sure the quality is top notch and if something has missed uh, by QA or the other team in the lower environment that is getting caught uh, on production and the third thing is I am really vocal about dog fooding bug bash um, we use something called fastly CDN so how it happens is when a feature, big feature is ready we open it up to our internal user to test it and it's only available to our uh, headquarters and other um, other um, location based on the IPs. So if they hit goodrx.com, they will always go to the new goodrx.com uh, with help of the CDN and fastly because we are routing um, the new goodrx.com to our employees to make sure that it's actually uh, uh, they are actually testing the newest feature. So these are the very three cool features which, which we can introduce to our team, shift left and mitigate risk for big uh, bulk projects and uh, make sure that we are doing due diligence uh, when we are testing. Coming to some statistics for uh, GoodRx, so we have 2.5 key visual regression, 300. Right now, these numbers are a little old, um, but we almost tested 49 unique uh, browser based combination in browser stack, and we have run 1 million tests in last um, nine months, more than 1 million. This is actually a screenshot from browser stack which says since last six months we have ran 837 tests um, and that was the graph how we um, scaled from 0 to 800,000 um, tests. So uh, I showed you very big numbers and uh, it comes with some issues, criticality and responsibility, right? So I'm going to give you some key highlights what we do in our framework that makes our automation so successful. First and foremost is a browser based class. So every every little click, every little action that we do on our um, website, it is wrapped um, in our browser based class and all the other tests actually extends it. So we have same actions for our mobile web and web. But when it comes to mobile web, you might, might have to do something um, different, some, something different sometimes. Um, like uh, sometimes you have to uh, make sure the native uh, controller is enabled, you have to click back. All these things are taken care in our browser based class. So if you are an ma automation manager and you are coaching your new team, make sure um, you know about these things and uh, you're implementing this kind of a base class to make your um, automation super successful. The next is page class. Um, I did tell you that uh, creating data QA ID is uh, embedded in our um, SDLC process. So this is the data QA ID. You see all the elements that we write, it has a unique data QA ID here. So how we have implemented here, it's called lazy um, initialization. So we created all the elements before even we are using uh, them in our test and when you call this element class it actually behind the back it does some plumbing what it does it is this one so it actually wait for the element it looks if it is a button it waits and sees if it is activated if it is a text box it waits for the cursor to be active this way we make sure our tests are not fragile 
and uh, like you don't have to call the same functions again and again each step which slows our test down so this is taken care in our framework itself the way we have written it uh, this is again another uh, wrapper class for Apply tools. So uh, we suggest everyone to use wrapper when you are working with third parties because sometimes they uh, introduce introduce like latest version of their SDKs and it's not supported with the old version. And if you don't have wrapper class, you will be like lost. You have to re rewrite everything from the beginning if they are changing the way a function works. So super duper important that you do this plumbing in your um, in your framework and you are using a wrapper class and you are logging all the exceptions and you are making sure that um, in one one place you are doing the stuff like um, for iOS you have to make sure the top header is uh, cutted off because that's like time and uh, um, date right so all these plumbings are done done here which makes our test super uh, duper um, fast and uh, reliable one thing i want to um, come here and tell you that we use, use page object models so it helps us keep all the elements in one class and go to one place to make sure if something changes we come there and we um, change there so it's, it's like very easy to handle. Some other cool thing we do is whenever our uh, backend engineer push stuff we get pinged in slack. Uh, we use browser stack APIs to let us know that what the failure exactly is. So we do not have any other reporting. You can just go to the browser stack uh, dashboard and you can see exactly if something failed, why it failed. It actually tells you here that we were expecting something in North Carolina, which was supposed to be false, but it, it's true right now. Like that pricing is showing up here. And uh, this is our uh, Jenkins, so this is our Spinnaker pipeline, which shows that um, our cross browsers are integrated, testing are integrated there. And this is um, browser stack. Okay, I need a minute. So this is this is a visual testing that I'm gonna talk about, and it's, it's super cool. Um, what it does, it it's like giving eyes to your automated test. It's it's uh, it it actually automatically tests the look and feel of your website. And I'm gonna sh show you some more stuff. But let's do a fun exercise. Take 30 seconds and let me know nine differences you see. Uh, in these two pictures, and whoever answers, I'm gonna give them three. Oh. Which one is it? Right. The copyright thing, you are right. Can you pass this? One, one at a time, please. Let me choose. Yes. The faint is different, right? Here there is four, there is three. He's right. Uh, yes. It's not there. He's right. Yes. Yeah, it's actually missing, right? Fingers are different, right? Uh, sorry, what is that? Who said? Um, right. The signature is not there on the left. Anyone else? Yes, absolutely right. Anyone else? There's more. There's more. No? Yes. Yeah, she's she's right. Anything else? There's more. Yes, yeah, somebody already told. Yeah, that's all we call it. Right, because one of the fences was missing, so the bush is, uh, uh, yeah, please. <laughs> cool. So you saw it took uh, 30 people, 30 seconds to find uh, um, nine or, or so differences. So just think about a poor QA analyst if he is or her job is to do this day in, day out. 15 times a day, I think he or she will go mad about it. So this is actually the difference. The leg is little bigger. Um, that was not said. This this has a difference here. The hand is actually little up. Um, this hand is actually little longer. Um, so these were the differences somebody didn't even say. It did not uh, 
came to our naked eye, right? Like we could not figure out. Like even this hand was totally bigger. So if you do an actual pixel to pixel comparison, you can actually see the differences. How the um, the leg is uh, little shifted, how the hand is little up and down, how that leg is missing, right? And so automa using automation, this is like super easy. Um, to say in within few seconds that what are the difference in a website which is going live uh, in production if there is any. So when we introduced that, some of the advantages we got is we like like we uh, increase our release velocity like anything. So from like one or two releases a day or a weekly releases we shoot to um, 10, 15 times a day because of uh, visual automation. And when it comes to visual automation, you have to think about quite a few stuff. So our sites are dynamic, like the pricing change. So if you do pixel to pixel comparison, it will fail every time. So we needed a tool where we could ignore some regions and we could use different kinds of uh, comparison. And Apple gives us that. So they have some different match levels. So if you say layout, they're going to go to website and just check the layout of that. Um, of that page and they, it will not check for the content, it will not check for the exact values. Uh, same with content, if you just say content, uh, it will go and it will just check for match the content but it will not check for other stuff. And if you do strict or exact, then it will do pixel to pixel um, validation on that. Also you can tell the test to ignore colors which is so, super cool because we run a lot of A-B tests with colors and font and sometimes we don't want to test those, we just want to ignore them. So super cool and they have some artificial intelligence so every time you thumbs up a failure their system learns it automatically that um, okay I'm not supposed to check this next time so it's, it's their system is learning continuously so these are some of Apple, Apple tools. So now coming to the fun part uh, these are actual my findings in my introduction slide I said I take guilty pleasure finding bugs in different apps so you see the left side it's uh, Macy's and the error message is actually behind the button. A normal functional test will not find this this bug because the text is present there. It's just hidden behind the uh, behind a button. Same thing some some random code snippets showed up on uh, Goodrx blog. Uh, a, a normal um, automation will not find regression test will not find it. And the right side is it's actually Amazon my real account. And the in product image and the descriptions um, became null and one day. And if they had visual regression, they could have caught it uh, before going to production. And this is examples from my own test suite that we found in lower environment after integrating with um, visual regression. It's like there is an extra zeros after each pricing in each row. Um, and some integration went wrong and the full page became black and that's how they showed the comparison like what was it before the baseline and then what is the new one. Then here some random dot showed up here and here one of the icon is missing like the CJS transfer logo is missing here. So you see there are a lot of values when you do this uh, visual regression and you can scale with it like no other because a normal manual test will take long time. So as a QA manager, you can introduce this tool and you can scale your team horizontally and find this full uh, bugs um, in lower environment. Some industry standard that Sauce Lab, one of the key player in uh, Cloud Runner has uh, uh, recently published uh, about continuous pipelines and uh, fortunately we all, I, like our team follows in um, GoodRx. So some quality benchmark is like, um, how many, what is the percentage that your automation test pass every time you run? 90% time it should be passing. Um, what is the test run time should be? It should be average test run time should be two minutes or less. Um, test platform coverage, at least you should run five platform um, in average. And what should be the concurrency? So suppose you have bought 25 parallel nodes. If you're running uh, your all the tests, you should be utilizing 75% of that 25 nodes. Otherwise, you're wasting um, money. So when they did this survey with some of the biggest players in the market like Walmart and Visa, they, they came up with this data that only 18.8% uh, actually fulfill this test quality criteria that uh, their 90% of their tests are 
passing when they're running their tests. Uh, 35.9% .35 of in the industry, like companies, they have a test which is less than two minutes. So it's like very important to make your tests like um, individual and independent so they are not taking long time. They are not waiting on another test. Uh, this, uh, then test platform, only 62.5% um, users um, have like five or more cross platform. And then the test conferency, it's pretty good, like 70.9% of users are using what they're buying there. But if you look at this number, this is surprising. Like only 6.2% of the organization achieves this for all four benchmarks. So we have so much more to do here, like as a manager, as a lead in our company to get to that benchmark. Um, so these are again some of the slides where they said like only 35.4% uh, users um, runs under two minutes and like there are seven plus minutes user as well, which is 10.42%. And like this is true and I know from my experience and when we start doing automation, we just use Chrome and we don't want to do cross browser because I sucks and it takes a lot of time. Developer hates, QA hates that. Um, so you see like 65% of the people are using only Chrome when they are doing cross browser and very less percentage are on 6.2 and very less percentage on, on others. And only 8.1% of the company uses real mobile device, which is really, really surprising. Like when you are testing and if you want to test properly, like you have to test it on a, on a real mobile device, like resizing a browser doesn't help much. Uh, there is a three minutes demo, but I think I'm almost uh, three minutes away to finish my talk. Um, I'm going to give you guys a chance to ask me a question and answer. Right, we use browser stack, so we have 10 device conferences for a real device app automation, but we have 100 conference devices with them for mobile web. And all latest one uh, with them. So that's how we handle, but we have an in-house uh, device farm as well, so where we have like four or five devices, but we don't want to buy everything in-house, we use like the runner. Yeah, exactly. It's, and it's hard to maintain in house as well. Yes, in the back. We don't, as, today we don't use Coslab, we use browser stack. Yeah, browser stack. Um, so, you mean uh, when we run the test, any lagging? We don't see any lagging while uh, run the test. So, because uh, as I was showing you the key points on our framework, like it, we have written it such a way that there is no um, like static sleep, there is like all the plumbing is done in our base class and uh, page classes, so um, there is no no lag introduced. And from their crowd runner, I haven't seen any lag so far. Like last night. Yes. We do not have the uh, API testing framework yet, but in my last company, we had REST Assured and Java. And we used to actually create the data dynamically before we used to run our tests, and that's where we want to go. Like we are only nine months old in my present company, so this is a goal for quarter three and four. Yeah, we want to do that. Right. Right. So by that time, I had three S dates uh, and three QA analysts total. So our QA analysts wrote all the test cases, and our test rapid, uh, S dates rapidly created the edge cases. And the, by that time, we also started integrating with visual regression. So that helped immensely. So total 300, but they are all data driven. Like if I actually count the data, it will come to a 6K. No, so HC uh, is responsible for framework, for tooling, um, writing test cases, like helping my release QA. So I have a separate release QA team who does not do any automation other than writing the test in BDD or in even normal step uh, expected result definition. But so my estate teams and my uh, offshore team enable those uh, release QAs to make releases faster. So like they are the more hands to them. 
that they can work fast and do. Yes. Uh, uh, we we do not exactly do like point by point basis how the code is coverage with our test, but we are integrated from the beginning of the um, uh, agile cycle, like from the, the from the design and planning that what tests we will be running. We show them that what tests we will be automating, what environment and um, what environment and IDs we need. So we are integrated and monitor. One second, for one, monitoring purposes, uh, we use uh, uh, Datadog. So when we go live, they monitor continuously that if, if there is any 500, 400 um, stuff or not. Yeah, so we have that for our unit test as well, but not for functional test. And but unit test is written by uh, developers. Yes, right, right. Yeah. Athlete. Yeah, you got a T-shirt. Says uh, uh, visually perfect. Passing, yes. Yeah, we aim for that. Right, so they did this benchmarking with like four or five very big companies and I have spoke to like when I interview, I have spoken to these people and they say they have like 10,000 tests and it runs for six days and then they sit down together as a whole team and they debug why, why the failures are. I, yeah, it does not help. I don't know. Then you might just do it manually only if it takes like six days for you to run all the tests. I think one thing people fail to understand is like you cannot automate everything and you should not automate everything. So uh, when they start automating everything, it becomes very large and uh, the run times become super large. So then they start failing. Yes. Hours also. Yes, so we have a unique strategy to handle that. We use cookies. So we have a specific cookies for our internal users. It's called DRX internal cookie. And uh, we set it purposefully. So our fastly, the CDN, when it, takes, when it checks for the website, it checks and looks if that special cookie is present in our call or not. So it whitelists us as through our browser stack and we are able to run tests in staging and lower environment. So you can use like Fastly kind of a CDN and a unique cookie so you don't have to use their um, uh, local testing. And uh, to go back to his point, is there any lagging? Yes, if you use local testing, there is a lag and we don't use that. We use this cookie strategy to whitelist ourselves. So it's like just opening a normal browser but setting the cookie in your base class. Yes. Oh, that, uh, you mean the code or, oh, right. This one? Hmm. This is a page object model, so these are the elements. No. Uh, we do use data provider to data drive our tests, but not for the element creation. But like our pages does not drastically change. Like it will not be exactly like 100% different. If it is, then yes, we have to rewrite it. That hasn't happened yet. Um, but uh, we do not, today we do not use any data provider for that, right? Okay. Okay. 
you know, those things and all. Thank you guys so much. I have some few more stuff like pins and uh, peel boxes if you are interested to take this down and take it. Thank you so much.